is your chance. By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Edgar Taylor and Marion Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. There was once a king's son, who had a bride whom he loved very much, and when he was sitting beside her, and very happy, news came that his father lay sick unto death, and desired to see him once again before his end. Then he said to his beloved, I must now go and leave you. I give you a ring as a remembrance of me. When I am king, I will return and fetch you. So he rode away, and when he reached his father, the latter was dangerously ill and near his death. He said to him, Dear son, I wish to see you once again before my end. Promise me to marry as I wish. And he named a certain king's daughter who was to be his wife. The son was in such trouble that he did not think what he was doing, and said, Yes, dear father, your will shall be done. And thereupon the king shut his eyes and died. When, therefore, the son had been proclaimed king, and the time of mourning was over, he was forced to keep the promise which he had given his father, and caused the king's daughter to be asked in marriage, and she was promised to him. His first betrothed heard of this, and fretted so much about his faithfulness that she nearly died. Then her father said to her, Dearest child, why are you so sad? You shall have whatsoever you will. She thought for a moment, and said, Dear father, I wish for eleven girls exactly like myself in face, figure, and size. The father said, If it be possible, your desire shall be fulfilled and he caused the search to be made in his whole kingdom, until eleven young maidens were found who exactly resembled his daughter in face, figure, and size. When they came to the king's daughter, she had twelve suits of huntsman's clothes made, all alike, and the eleven maidens had to put on the huntsman's clothes, and she herself put on the twelfth suit. Thereupon she took her leave of her father, and rode away with them and rode to the court of her former betrothed, whom she loved so dearly. Then she asked if he required any huntsman, and if he would take all of them into his service. The king looked at her, and did not know her. But as they were such handsome fellows, he said, Yes, and that he would willingly take them. And now they were the king's twelve huntsmen. The king, however, had a lion, which was a wondrous animal, for he knew all concealed and secret things. It came to pass that one evening he said to the king, "'You think you have twelve huntsmen?' "'Yes,' said the king, "'they are twelve huntsmen.' The lion continued, "'You are mistaken. They are twelve girls.' The king said, "'That cannot be true. How will you prove that to me?' "'Oh, just let some peas be strewn in the antechamber,' answered the lion, "'and then you will soon see. "'Men have a firm step, and when they walk over peas none of them stir. "'But girls trip and skip and drag their feet, and the peas roll about.' "'The king was well pleased with the council, and caused the peas to be strewn. "'There was, however, a servant of the king's who favoured the huntsman, and when he heard that they were going to be put to this test, he went to them, and repeated everything, and said, The lion wants to make the king believe that you are girls. Then the king's daughter thanked him, and said to her maidens, Show some strength, and step firmly on the peas. So next morning, when the king had the twelve huntsmen called before him, and they came into the antechamber where the peas were lying, they stepped so firmly on them, and had such a strong, sure walk, that not one of the peas either rolled or stirred. Then they went away again, and the king said to the lion, "'You have lied to me. They walk just like men.' The lion said, 
They have been informed that they were going to be put to the test and have assumed some strength. Just let twelve spinning-wheels be brought into the antechamber, and they will go to them and be pleased with them, and that is what no man would do. The king liked the advice, and had the spinning-wheels placed in the antechamber. But the servant, who was well disposed to the huntsman, went to them and disclosed the project. So, when they were alone, the king's daughter said to her eleven girls, "'Show some restraint, and do not look round at the spinning-wheels.' And the next morning, when the king had his twelve huntsmen summoned, she went through the antechamber and never once looked at the spinning-wheels. Then the king again said to the lion, "'You have deceived me. They are men, for they have not looked at the spinning-wheels.' The lion replied, they have restrained themselves. The king, however, would no longer believe the lion. The twelve huntsmen always followed the king to the chase, and his liking for them continually increased. Now it came to pass that once, when they were out hunting, news came that the king's bride was approaching. When the true bride heard that, it hurt her so much that her heart was almost broken, and she fell fainting to the ground. The king thought something had happened to his dear huntsman, ran up to him, wanted to help him, and drew his glove off. Then he saw the ring which he had given to his first bride, and when he looked in her face he recognized her. Then his heart was so touched that he kissed her, and when she opened her eyes he said, "'You are mine, and I am yours, and no one in the world can alter that.' He sent a messenger to the other bride, and entreated her to return to her own kingdom, for he had a wife already, and someone who had just found an old key did not require a new one. Thereupon the wedding was celebrated, and the lion was again taken into favor, because, after all, he had told the truth. End of the Twelve Huntsmen THE KING OF THE GOLDEN MOUNTAIN FROM GRIMM'S FAIRY TALES BY JACOB AND WILHELM GRIMM TRANSLATED BY EDGAR TAYLOR AND MARIAN EDWARDS THIS LIBRIVOX RECORDING IS IN THE PUBLIC DOMAIN READ BY BOB NEWFELD THERE WAS ONCE A MERCHANT WHO HAD ONLY ONE CHILD, A SON, THAT WAS VERY YOUNG AND BARELY ABLE TO RUN ALONE. He had two richly laden ships then making a voyage upon the seas, in which he had embarked all his wealth, in the hope of making great gains, when the news came that both were lost. Thus from being a rich man he became all at once so very poor that nothing was left to him but one small plot of land, and there he often went in an evening to take his walk, and ease his mind of a little of his trouble. One day, as he was roaming along in a brown study, thinking with no great comfort on what he had been and what he now was, and was like to be, all on a sudden there stood before him a little rough-looking black dwarf. "'Prithee, friend, why so sorrowful?' said he to the merchant. "'What is it you take so deeply to heart?' "'If you would do me any good, I would willingly tell you,' said the merchant." "'Who knows, but I may,' said the little man. "'Tell me what ails you, and perhaps you may find I may be of some use.' Then the merchant told him how all his wealth was gone to the bottom of the sea, and how he had nothing left but that little plot of land. "'Oh, trouble not yourself about that,' said the dwarf. "'Only undertake to bring me here, twelve years hence, whatever meets you first on your going home.' and I will give you as much as you please. The merchant thought this was no great thing to ask, that it would most likely be his dog, or his cat, or something of that sort, but forgot his little boy, Heinel. So he agreed to the bargain, and signed and sealed the bond to do what was asked of him. But as he drew near home, his little boy was so glad to see him, that he crept behind him, and laid fast hold of his legs, and looked up in his face and laughed. Then the father started, trembling with fear and horror, and saw what it was that he had bound himself to do. 
but as no gold was come, he made himself easy by thinking that it was only a joke that the dwarf was playing him, and that, at any rate, when the money came, he should see the bearer and would not take it in. About a month afterwards he went upstairs into a lumber-room to look for some old iron, that he might sell it and raise a little money, and there, instead of his iron, he saw a large pile of gold lying on the floor. At the sight of this he was overjoyed, and, forgetting all about his son, went into trade again, and became a richer merchant than before. Meanwhile little Heinel grew up, and, as the end of the twelve years drew near, the merchant began to call to mind his bond, and became very sad and thoughtful, so that care and sorrow were written upon his face. The boy one day asked what was the matter, but his father would not tell him for some time. At last, however, he said that he had, without knowing it, sold him for gold to a little ugly-looking black dwarf, and that the twelve years were coming round when he must keep his word. Then Heinel said, "'Father, give yourself very little trouble about that. I shall be too much for the little man.' When the time came, the father and son went out together to the place agreed upon, and the son drew a circle on the ground, and set himself and his father in the middle of it. The little black dwarf soon came, and walked round and round about the circle, but could not find any way to get into it and he either could not or dared not jump over it. At last the boy said to him, "'Have you anything to say to us, my friend, or what do you want?' Now Heinel had found a friend in a good fairy that was fond of him, and had told him what to do, for this fairy knew what good luck was in store for him. "'Have you brought me what you said you would?' said the dwarf to the merchant. The old man held his tongue. But Heinel said again, "'What do you want here?' The dwarf said, "'I come to talk with your father, not with you.' "'You have cheated and taken in my father,' said the son. "'Pray give him up his bond at once.' "'Fair and softly,' said the little old man, "'right is right. I have paid my money, and your father has had it, and spent it. So be so good as to let me have what I paid it for.' "'You must have my consent to that first, said Heinel. "'So please to step in here, and let us talk it over.' The old man grinned and showed his teeth, as if he should have been very glad to get into the circle if he could. Then, at last, after a long talk, they came to terms. Heinel agreed that his father must give him up, and that so far the dwarf should have his way. But, on the other hand, the fairy had told Heinel what fortune was in store for him, if he followed his own course, and he did not choose to be given up to his humpbacked friend, who seemed so anxious for his company. So, to make a sort of drawn battle of the matter, it was settled that Heinel should be put into an open boat that lay on the seashore hard by, that the father should push him off with his own hand, and that he should thus be set adrift and left to the bad or good luck of wind and weather. Then he took leave of his father, and set himself in the boat, but before it got far off a wave struck it, and it fell with one side low in the water, so the merchant thought that poor Heinel was lost, and went home very sorrowful, while the dwarf went his way, thinking that at any rate he had had his revenge. The boat, however, did not sink for the good fairy took care of her friend, and soon raised the boat up again, and it went safely on. The young man sat safe within, till at length it ran ashore upon an unknown land. As he jumped upon the shore, he saw before him a beautiful castle, but empty and dreary within, for it was enchanted. Here, said he to himself, must I find the prize the good fairy told me of. So he once more searched the whole palace through, till at last he found a white snake lying coiled up on a cushion in one of the chambers. Now the white snake was an enchanted princess, and she was very glad to see him, and said, "'Are you at last come to set me free?' 
Twelve long years have I waited for the fairy to bring you hither as she promised, for you alone can save me. This night twelve men will come. Their faces will be black, and they will be dressed in chain armor. They will ask what you do here, but give no answer, and let them do what they will, beat, whip, pinch, prick, or torment you, bear all. Only oh, speak not a word, and at twelve o'clock they must go away. The second night twelve others will come, and the third night twenty-four, who will even cut off your head, but at the twelfth hour of that night their power is gone, and I shall be free, and will come and bring you the water of life, and will wash you with it, and bring you back to life and health. And all came to pass as she had said. Heinel bore all, and spoke not a word. And the third night the princess came, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. Joy and gladness burst forth throughout the castle. The wedding was celebrated, and he was crowned king of the Golden Mountain. They lived together very happily, and the queen had a son. And thus eight years had passed over their heads, when the king thought of his father and began to long to see him once again. But the queen was against his going, and said, I know well what misfortunes will come upon us if you go. However, he gave her no rest till she agreed. At his going away she gave him a wishing ring, and said, Take this ring and put it on your finger. Whatever you wish it will bring you. Only promise never to make use of it to bring me hence to your father's house. Then he said he would do what she asked, and put the ring on his finger, and wished himself near the town where his father lived. Heino found himself at the gates in a moment, but the guards would not let him go in, because he was so strangely clad. So he went up to a neighboring hill, where a shepherd dwelt, and borrowed his old frock, and thus passed unknown into the town. When he came to his father's house, he said he was his son, but the merchant would not believe him, and said he had had but one son, his poor Heinel, who he knew was long since dead. And as he was only dressed like a poor shepherd, he would not even give him anything to eat. The king, however, still vowed that he was his son, and said, Is there no mark by which you would know me, if I am really your son? Yes, said his mother. Our Heinel had a mark like a raspberry on his right arm. Then he showed them the mark, and they knew that what he had said was true. He next told them how he was king of the Golden Mountain, and was married to a princess, and had a son seven years old. But the merchant said, That can never be true. He must be a fine king, truly, who travels about in a shepherd's frock. At this the son was vexed, and forgetting his word, turned his ring and wished for his queen and son. In an instant they stood before him. But the queen wept, and said he had broken his word, and bad luck would follow. He did all he could to soothe her and she at last seemed to be appeased. But she was not so, in truth, and was only thinking how she should punish him. One day he took her to walk with him out of the town, and showed her the spot where the boat was set adrift upon the wide waters. Then he sat himself down, and said, "'I am very much tired. Sit by me. I will rest my head in your lap and sleep a while.' As soon as he had fallen asleep, however, she drew the ring from his finger, and crept softly away, and wished herself and her son at home in their kingdom. And when he awoke, he found himself alone, and saw that the ring was gone from his finger. "'I can never go back to my father's house,' said he. "'They would say I am a sorcerer. I will journey forth into the world till I come again to my kingdom.' So saying, he set out and travelled, till he came to a hill where three giants were sharing their father's goods, and as they saw him pass, they cried out, and said, Little men have sharp wits. He Best line ever. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny, bro.
he shall part the goods between us. Now, there was a sword that cut off an enemy's head whenever the wearer gave the words heads off, a cloak that made the owner invisible, or gave him any form he pleased, and a pair of boots that carried the wearer wherever he wished. Heinel said they must first let him try these wonderful things, then he might know how to set a value upon them. Then they gave him the cloak, and he wished himself a fly, and in a moment he was a fly. "'The cloak is very well,' said he. "'Now give me the sword.' "'No,' said they, "'not unless you undertake not to say heads off. For if you do, we are all dead men.' So they gave it to him, charging him to try it on a tree. He next asked for the boots also, and the moment he had all three in his power, he wished himself at the golden mountain. There he was at once. So the giants were left behind with no goods to share or quarrel about. As Heino came near his castle, he heard the sound of merry music, and the people around told him that his queen was about to marry another husband. Then he threw his cloak around him, and passed through the castle hall, and placed himself by the side of the queen, where no one saw him. But when anything to eat was put upon her plate, he took it away and ate it himself, and when a glass of wine was handed to her, he took it and drank it, and thus, though they kept on giving her meat and drink, her plate and cup were always empty. Upon this fear and remorse came over her, and she went into her chamber alone and sat there weeping, and he followed her there. Alas, she said to herself, was I not once set free? Why, then, does this enchantment still seem to bind me? False and fickle one, said he. One indeed came who set thee free, and he is now near thee again. But how have you used him? Ought he to have had such a treatment from thee? Then he went out and sent away the company, and said the wedding was at an end, for that he was come back to the kingdom. But the princes, peers, and great men mocked at him. However, he would enter into no parley with them, but only asked them if they would go in peace or not. Then they turned upon him, and tried to seize him, but he drew his sword. Heads off! cried he, and with the word the traitors' heads fell before him, and Heinel was once more king of the Golden Mountain. End of The King of the Golden Mountain